is Rob Lumberg, host of Uncontaminated Sound. That was a little jingle created for the show by LA-based Walter ETC, or as some may formally know as Walter Mitty and his makeshift orchestra. And a new addition, a visual intro by visual artist Kevin Gilmore. And if you're listening via audio, please, please, I beg of you to check it out on our YouTube channel at Uncontaminated Sound as... The video adds much more dimension to my little conversation series here. Now, Conversation 57. For about an hour, Kingston, New York-based record producer, mixer, photographer, and filmmaker Daniel James Goodwin and I nerded out over music, film scores, and photography. Lighting a few smokes, Daniel wafted through the haze in which set the mood for reflection of decades in the studio. We flow into the expanse of conversation with a pragmatic resolve to pull from the theoretical realm of creativity, all the while attempting to flesh out the objective truths of our artistry. So if you got all that, please enjoy Conversation 57 with Daniel James Goodwin. Thank you. R.L. Well... Daniel, thank you for joining me on uh, on Kadam and Sounds. Um, like I, I just briefly introduced uh, the series off records. Um, I'm, I'm curious, I guess. Uh, I, I always like to start, you know, in story structure, beginning, middle, end, I guess. Where does your creative journey begin? Uh, I know a lot of people I've spoken to uh, started early on or was that with you, yourself as well um do you start high school or middle school etc or how how did you get into started, your creative path i started pretty early i was um i was a musician in high school uh and grade school i didn't take piano lessons which is one thing i regret to this day but mm-hmm. i played saxophone in school band and then started playing guitar and stuff and in high school Um, like most musicians, I had a band and I was sort of the guy who my dad had a basement. So we practiced in the basement. I got a four track. I saved up pizza delivery money for a four track. And I sort of was the, I was the nerd of the band. And, um, that's kind of where it started. And in fact, uh, a former bandmate of mine regaled with me with this story recently that I would, uh, we would record demos, you know, we were 15, 14, 15. Yeah. We would record demos on the four track. The rest of the guys would go home. I'd replace all their parts and then play it for them the next day. And they'd all be like, what the fuck did you just do? Yeah. <laughs> so I, obviously I was predisposed to doing this for a living. And I think, yeah, from there, it just sort of bit me. And uh, I was always creating when I was younger, but the, the, the craft of being in the studio, I guess, was something I didn't realize I loved until then, until I was screwing around with four tracks and such. And to remind people who, who, who are not too, too familiar with your work, you're a mixer, engineer, producer, and photographer. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, how do you, does one, are you more engineer compared to the rest? Or like, how do you really um, I suppose identify? Probably the, the thing I do most is probably mixing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, probably mixing. Um, but the thing I, I would consider myself an engineer and producer first and foremost, mm-hmm. whether it's mixing or recording. And then a, a, the photography thing was sort of my first love was always film from mm-hmm. when I was very, very young. And I had designs on going to college for film. And I ended up going to college for one year and I dropped out precipitously because I hated it. Yeah. And I was also at that point, I, I started assisting in a recording studio when I was 16. So I kind of, already started carving a path while I was in high school and then that precluded any work in the film world and also when you know in the in the early 90s when I was a teenager making a low budget film was not all that easy and you didn't really have access to any reasonably good equipment unless you were in school or had access to money so it seemed like a foregone conclusion that I just wasn't going to be a part of that world but it remained a huge love of mine and photography was kind of a I guess an offspring of that love. And I've always had a love for images, whether they're stills or moving. I just find so much language in them. And it even informs what I do musically. A lot of what I do, I see visually 
um, as an image in my head when I'm working on music. So they, they relate for sure. But the photography thing is just sort of a love of mine. And I just so happen to get paid for it from time to time. But um, <laughs> yeah, that's sort of the way that worked out. Oh, cool. But I'd certainly call myself a mixer first and foremost. Interesting. Now, did you just really pick off uh, pick up the trade uh, in the beginning? I, obviously, kind of working with the studio at, at an early age. But is there a real science or craft to it too? Like, I'm really not too familiar with the, the mixing and engineering process, but is there really sure, yeah. like components or like, I don't say like algorithms or, or just like, is there just certain equations, probably long language because I don't know, but is it just the ear for music or do you really have to know the technicalities of engineering as well? It's definitely all the above, but I'd say a huge part of it, it, I would actually liken it to photography in the sense that, you know, there are things like aperture, there are things like shutter speed, there are things like film chemistry, mm. uh, particularly when you get into analog photography that relate pretty, pretty, they map on pretty one-to-one with audio work. Mm. Um, and that all being said, it's also the sort of thing that you can, because the eye or the ear are so critical in the presentation of your work, um, particularly if you're a creative worker, not just sort of a technician, mm. you know, there's a difference if you're just taking shots at a high school for high school yearbooks or whatnot. That's obviously a different sort of craft than what you do or what I do, be it audio or photography. And as soon as you start to step into it creatively, you can kind of abandon the rule set a little bit. Mm. Um, that said, I sort of come from the world where I like understanding what the rules are. So I know where I can, where I can fuck with them and manipulate them to, to do something creatively interesting, but it's definitely, yeah, there's definitely a skill required to do what I do yeah. to people is a huge one. You kind of broke up a bit, Daniel, uh, zoom again, or. Oh, okay. Can you, uh, can you hear yeah. me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, you just froze up, but you good. I think you're good now. Oh yeah. Do you see me now? Yeah. Good? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, it's just, I don't, maybe know, the, a little I don't know where that lag and zoom again, but, uh, <laughs> oh, there you are. So yeah. Annoying. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know where that broke up, but but there's definitely a lot of skill necessary to do what we do. But I would say that the creative aspect is probably a bit more critical. Your creative perspective is as critical as anything. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure um, over the years, you, you developed your own kind of uh, methodology, I would say, is if that's oh, sure. Term. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Absolutely. I think, you know, the, the people I work with tend to work with me because I have a perspective and the work that I do sort of feels and sounds a certain way. Mm. Uh, and I think there's probably a creative fingerprint that I put on the stuff that I do. Yeah. Now, when was it, when was the point where you, you wanted to kind of spin off from working uh, at a studio to really uh, forming your own studio and your own business regarding that uh, aspect? That's been a, I, I had that feeling pretty early on. I've always been pretty much a, um, I'm kind of an autodidact. I learn things as I go and I just sort of like to have nothing forcing my path one way or the other aside from my own perspectives on things. So yeah, I think even in my 20s, I knew that I was going to have my own studio at some point and that I was just going to work primarily out of my own place. And then it just became a function at that point of finances and having access to something that was right. But yeah, I think pretty early on, I, I knew that I didn't want to sort of be working for other people. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of... And really, so I've been yeah. like, I, I guess I never really properly worked. I properly worked in a studio for maybe five years as a staff engineer. And then after that, I've been freelance pretty much my entire adult life. Wow. And now uh, you have a physical location and uh, is it still, it, it's Kingston now, correct? Or yeah, yeah, in Woodstock prior yeah, I was in, now? I was in Woodstock for 11 years uh, in this beautiful old a-frame house this mid-century a-frame house and then with the current real estate frenzy going on the the owner decided to sell and it was beyond my price bracket so um 
I moved in, I'm in the old IBM building that's in Kingston. Hmm. And it's sort of, it was decommissioned from IBM many years ago. And I'm now in the old conference room, which is just this big, massive open space and with some isolation and stuff. But I work in this large, wild, old conference room. It's pretty hmm. amazing. Well, that, it's funny because like, uh, I've heard a lot of people kind of transplanting from uh, Woodstock to Kingston or moving over, you know, from Woodstock yeah. because the, the, the property has gone through the roof in the last couple oh, of years. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a member of uh, the, the uh, Center for Photography at Woodstock and they're moving their, their location yeah. to, to Kingston as well, you know, and um, yeah. it was a beautiful location, but once again, you know. Yeah, yeah. That's that crazy. was the old Tinker Street Cafe, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was I really like that space. Yeah, yeah, it was great. Um, yeah, it's Wood Woodstock has become a very different place than when I was there. I mean, I lived there. I moved there originally in two thousand six, and then found my studio in two thousand ten. Um, so I have a really long time and everything's changed. It was always sort of like, there was always an aspect of it that was kind of just at the brink of really falling apart for normal working artists, you know? Yeah. And, but it managed to somehow have some equilibrium, but, but now it's completely out of whack and disjointed. Yeah, I think uh, actually I was having the, the conversation with the director at CPW um, and uh, you know, I think it, it's the, the influx of people just transplanting from the, the city with money to, to just go to Woodstock I'm in Beacon right now, and, and Beacon's yeah. going crazy like that, too, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. And um, anyway, sorry to, yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, I don't know, man. Like, sorry, I, I, I kind of just freeform things. Sorry if there's oh, no. Yeah. I love it. It's I'm great. going on um, tangents. Uh, I guess, did you have any major influences, I guess, in the industry? Re maybe not even just engineering wise, but visually wise too. And also film, oh, yeah. I love film myself. Vis I love yeah. visual language myself. So if we, I love to go deep in that aspect Oh, too, for sure. So. Yeah. I mean, I'm a huge, as you see behind me, there's a big projector screen here. Yeah. And so yeah. I watch films all day while I'm working. When the band is in here working, we just watch films all day. Yeah. Um, I'm a huge Tarkovsky fan, probably yeah. my favorite filmmaker of all time uh kubrick stanley kubrick is a big influence on me composition compositionally kubrick is pretty much the bee's knees for me yes um and then you know like modern directors like lars von trier and i've been really taken with this guy robert eggers who did the lighthouse and the witch hmm. um but i've also and i get a lot of influence from that stuff that stuff probably influences my audio work and music work as much as any music does just because the language is so like when I see images in a film that really move me, I, I feel it come through me and, and it kind of happens in the way that music comes through me and it comes through me in music, you know, and I'm referencing this stuff sort of internally all the time. And uh, one another director that I love is Yorgos Lanthimos, hmm. who did The Lobster and The Killing of a Sacred Deer, like two of my favorite films the last 10 years. Yeah. I guess that's sort of like very um the use of negative space visually influences my production work quite a bit mm. and i so i can make that parallel for sure uh, and those are huge influences on me visual both visually photo photographically and musically i love that stuff and it just sort of works its way into everything that i do well i noticed um, that uh, a few stills on your series let go i love your use of space too oh thank you yeah I just uh, where where did you make those images too? I'm curious, like with the desert was, or um, we were we were out in Wyoming at the in the Red Desert mm. and near this thing called Boar's Tusk, which is this crazy, big monolithic natural formation that comes out of the earth, probably like 120 feet tall, and um, there's these massive sand dunes in the middle of Red Desert in Wyoming. The amazing thing is like an hour north you're in Jackson Hole, which is very dense, lush, forested mountain. And then this is the Red Desert, which is completely barren, as you see. And um, so my partner, Monique, and I, who's all, she's also a photographer, we go out there every year. Every summer, we go out to um, Wyoming and spend about a little, little less than a month and just take pictures, kind of hang out with our dogs. And so we went out there one day 
and she had the idea for the the lace thing and just sort of taking random photographs in the desert and then we found this one massive dune where i did that series and shot that with the sony a7 and i think most of the probably i have a set of old Russian Soviet um, lenses. And I think that's probably the 50 millimeter on that. I, I can't remember for sure, but um, and we and um, but that's one of my favorites here and take photographs of every. I think I lost you. Yeah, no, we kind of broke up during. Um, I think I, I definitely heard uh, the Sony A7, correct? And yep. then I think you were describing maybe the lens uh, possibly. Um, 50 oh, yeah, 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 I, I have a bunch of old Soviet lenses, and I think that was probably an old uh, Lomo 50 millimeter. Oh, cool. Yeah, no, I, I, I love kind of like mixing digital and analog, too. Like, I just yeah. love, uh, actually, the other day, I've just been wandering the city with this, like, pointing shoot here, this Olympic pointing oh, yeah. shoot. It comes out pretty cool, though. I mean, it looks like film, like, effect. Yeah, and yeah. I think it's from, like, early 2000s but it, it looks like film granular yeah. film look and it's great for street i use stuff. a bunch of those old um i have a whole collection of old takamura lenses you know that used to come with pentax like spotmatics and stuff yeah, yeah and i love what they do all the edge distortion looks gorgeous and they have this built-in sort of color rendering that just you can't modern glass doesn't do the same thing the only time i have a trouble a problem is we do a lot of automotive ph photography like collector cars and stuff yeah and it, it's great for character shots but if you're trying to get like a i do a lot of manual focus with those old lens it's all i can do so if there's a shot of a car driving it's actually very difficult to pan with that and you know the lens like the sharpness isn't the best once you get right outside the center sharpness just goes to hell yeah um but i love shooting those lenses because it gives everything an immediate character you know well no i totally agree and like I, I'm looking into older lenses too for more portrait stuff or more still or object oriented kind of shots. Yeah. Cause I'm, I'm fascinated. Like I have a degree in criminal justice. Right. I, I kind of approach photography. Like a, uh, I was always fascinated with the uh, forensics. Right. So I yeah. kind of approach a lot of my stuff, side stuff besides music and stuff. Um, like a forensic, uh, forensic documentarian uh, or forensic uh, crime scene investigator. So I love um, objects, man. So like, this is a, a little print of a found nail you know oh, beautiful yeah and um i just love objects and uh kind of yeah. documenting our, our our hubris we leave behind it just uh, when i'm just wandering you know and uh absolutely kind of collect that and just have a, this little overhead led and kind of do some minor studio stuff here and um, right right that I, i'm i'm building up a project i don't know what it's something's building but i've been all through these these uh pandemic days i've been like experimenting a lot and uh i also paint i i, I love painting and uh um, yeah. kind of conversely like I'll, I'll like like in regards to you translating image to music i'll translate like an image to more painting or a bit like with oil and, and sketching and stuff right. too um right which is which is interesting how you know the way the mind works uh regarding like visual language and then how it but i i don't know where it's going with that but throughout my like conversations th with musicians fine artists sound engineers there's all a common common language though i there's a construct that imagery and sound go hand in hand i i found i absolutely. think absolutely and um, absolutely like I can't edit photos without music playing. Yeah. I can't yeah. do it in silence, you know, and I'll choose music based on sort of the atmosphere I'm trying to build when I'm editing in post-production, you know, yeah. all the time. And I've, I've, I'm not even conscious of it. It's just the natural thing that happens. I'm sure you do the same thing. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, like with everything so like super crisp and over a lot of uh, sound, like commercial sounds, like, super crisp and overproduced and have you have you created a method or um or have you experimented with like analog sound too or like 
really oh, raw, yeah. uh, raw sounding Ab- stuff? Or? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I came up when I was first learning again, it was the early nineties. So I was still using analog tape. Hmm. and still into the mid 2000s using tape and i guess i i left tape behind when well for one it became scarce um there was a period of time in the mid 2000s where you just couldn't get tape for a minute and i got used to working digitally as a result but i also in the process of that i guess growing up using this stuff using analog tape and working in that way the stuff that people love now about tape at the time to me was a bug not a feature And so I was, I really was looking forward to getting to a time where those variables didn't exist. And the first time I heard digital come back to me, the way I put sound in, I was like, oh, wait, I actually have way more power now. Um, But that being said, I still use, like, I have old little Spire tape recorders that are tiny little tape recorders. I'll often send stuff to that just for effect. Um, Tape echoes and tape delays are a huge part of my, my sounds old spring reverbs and mechanical reverbs. So yeah, I think like digital has become a capture medium for me, Mm. but the implements that I use before it gets to digital are all pretty much analog. And I have a huge, you know, like there's a big console behind me here. So I still mix on that. And in this building I have, I'm surrounded by these massive hallways and stairwells. So I put a speaker out there often and use them as reverb chambers, which is amazing. And it's actually real space, so it sounds different than a, than a plug-in or something like that. And all of that stuff, the digital stuff, all has a place, and it's all a tool. But um, So I don't really like, I'm not bound by any dogma about it. I just don't really use tape anymore because I find it to be a little too frustrating. Mm. And it's also ecologically not that good. <laughs> so yeah. I, I don't really want to perpetuate that thing. Um, and I can get, you know, I sort of feel, feel like I can get to where I, like, no matter how what tools I have to work with. I have an idea in my head of what I want something to sound like. So I'm going to make it sound that way, no matter what tools are in front of me. Yeah. Um, And that's just the way I've always approached it. You know, it makes sense. Yeah, no, it's, it, it it really, it's more of the methodology comparatively to any tool in front, like you said, in front of you. I mean, that's, that's the practitioner's kind of ethos, right? It's like, you can give me, you know, just a, you know, pencil for, and I, I can draw you anything or, you know, give me yeah. any camera and I still can compose a beautiful image with a cell Absolutely. phone, with this guy, with uh, analog, digital, whatever. It, it's all, yep. it's all in the, the mind. It's all Absolutely. how the practitioner kind of thinks um, and, and yep. the methodology. And um, I'm kind of curious. So like, did you have a mentor kind of like starting out in the, the biz or in the engineering? Yeah. I, I did. I, I was, um, I had two really, two big mentors. One was this guy named John Holbrook hmm. and he passed uh, two years ago or a year and a half ago now, but he's an old English engineer hmm. and he moved over here from the UK in the seventies and worked for Bearsville records and Bearsville studios for a long time. So he was a mentor to me. And then Neil Dorfman, who's still with us and still making records. Uh, he's worked with people like Dylan and, and uh, Mark Knopfler and uh, Sting and people like that. So those two are big, huge. I mean, they taught me a lot of the things I know for sure. And I apprenticed under them and assisted under them in the early days of what of doing this. And they were huge to me. They were huge mentors to me. Yeah. It's been a long time since I've really had anybody that's inspired me in that way. But, you know, I often hear work that inspires me if it's other people. Um, And I'm always trying to sort of learn just by doing things that I haven't done before and constantly removing myself from my comfort zone. Mm. but those two were huge for everything like the basis of what i know okay yeah yeah um actually i was gonna kind of follow up with like um what were you listening to then like musically and then what are you listening to now like what what uh what's really hitting you here now and com- comparatively then i guess then i was blessed with parents that even though they were divorced when i was young they both were incredibly open musically and had really good record collections. Like my dad loved Zappa and mm-hmm. Zeppelin and things of, along those lines. My mom loved, my mom was into contemporary stuff at the time. So the early nineties would have been, I guess for her, she liked R and B stuff and Prince. She loved Prince. Um, my dad also liked a lot of older country Western music. And I didn't really gravitate toward that when I was a kid, but 
it kept me open, you know? And yeah. I suppose when I was in my teens, I went through phases, but the cure was huge for me. Um, Jane's addiction, a lot of classic rock like Zappa and Cr Crimson and stuff from my dad, for sure. Fugazi, things like mm -hmm. that. And then as I got older, I started getting into more gentle music or more atmospheric music and a lot more electronic music. Like now I pretty much listen, I listen to classical music every day in the morning. It's just a habit now. It's usually like box piano etudes or something like that, just to sort of warm me to the day. Mm -hmm. uh, I listen to a ton of old jazz and a lot of electronic music, like um, a lot of ambient music, Aphex Twin sort of ambient volumes one and two, that stuff I love. And anything experimental always sort of gets me interested. Mm. And because I work with so many singer songwriters, I don't tend to listen to a lot of singer songwriter music because I work on it so often. And I don't really want to be influenced by what the trends are and what the, you know, sort of the cultural aesthetic is of the moment. I don't really want to inform my work too much. So I tend not to listen to the things like what I work on, you know, mm. which is an interesting thing. Oh, it makes total sense if you're just surrounded by, oh, in a work, you know, professional setting, you know, yeah. kind of want to just separate that because it's your work, your, yeah. your professional work comparably to, you know, what you want to you just tap, open up your mind to. So it's like, it's a, yeah. I, but I understand, like, I, I've kind of evolved my, like, I grew up uh, listening to, you know, started, I think my first CD was Nirvana, you know, never mind, you yeah. know, and then yeah. I was also listening to Tupac and Biggie, you know, and it's like, right, right. Kid from the suburbs from Massachusetts is listening to both, you know, and uh, yeah, uh, but then like I've, I've expanded my, my listening palette now to, you know, I classical jazz. Um, actually, I love like trans and, and uh, electronic because I'm actually really you know, understand or just reading or light research on um, the power of music to heal the mind. And uh, oh, yeah. with like transcendent, I, I'm going to mispronounce this, but like the trans stuff will really tap into the subconscious and really help you Absolutely. heal. And I, I, it's fascinating, like the more experimental yeah, yeah. stuff too, really cool to take yeah. you to a higher plane of consciousness, which I found Absolutely. is super cool and yeah still don't understand yeah, i'm a huge i'm yet. a huge fan of in, uh, instrumental music has always been very big to me mm. because it's like my daily wallpaper and as much as i love storytelling i want to sort of be a fresh listener for a story and so if i'm doing tasks around the house or if i'm driving or if i'm cleaning up my studio for instance i'll put on instrumental music whether it's jazz or classical or electronic music mm. and electronic music in particular like something like Boards of Canada, it puts me in a sort of this place and it puts me in a world that I'm inside of for that 45 minutes or however long the record is. And I just, I appreciate being transported there, you know? Yeah. That and I don't always want to be transported. Like singers, uh, songwriters in the, tr in the classic traditional sense, they tell you a story, but you have to sort of be a captive audience in the sense that you have to be willing to, to, they'll take you to a place, but they're going to describe the place. And I, I almost don't want that all the time. I sort of want to be taken to a place and dropped in, but I want to sort of choose my own adventure. Yeah. And that's what, like, that's what instrumental music does for me. And that's why I love it so much. Oh, yeah, I totally get that because yeah, it's like the, the, the singer songwriters, the narrator to that world yeah. and what they perceive. So it's in their perspective of what they're trying to convey to you, but with, yeah say classical or their experimental stuff or you know electronic it's like it just gives you the freedom to dive into like you said to choose your own adventure kind of totally. and uh you know what i found cool too it's like listening to that stuff i, I actually visually see the the space i'm i'm, I'm falling yeah. into right it's absolutely it's, absolutely it's totally yeah, natural huge, too just... without any substance or yep. anything it's just like just exactly. the sound waves are just trans you're transporting into this new world just through sound waves i guess absolutely yeah fascinating absolutely. phenomenon um it really is yeah i mean that said i still love like anybody a guilty pleasure of putting on like fleetwood mac rumors you know and singing yeah. along and, and doing the fist in the air in the car like i love that shit too but there's just something like you said that 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 the the, the visual kind of 
the visual manifestation of listening to something like Boards of Canada or, yeah, it, it, instrumental music in general is so powerful to me. And I guess some people probably don't have that, but uh, people who are drawn to um, imagery, I, I suppose, like you and I would probably relate to that, you know. And by the way, did you see the new Dune? Have you seen it? I, I didn't. It's on my list. I sort of, I'm going through a um, Cobra Kai thing right now. Okay. <laughs> and so once that's finished, <laughs> I just need to like scratch that itch. And once that's finished, I get back to serious watching. Oh, you, you, you have to see this. Oh, visually, yeah. the cinematography is absolutely wonderful. It, it was amazing. That's what I've heard. Yeah. Because, you know, generally like these days, it's too much CGI and it's like, right. They, they, where, uh, I forget who the cinematographer was, but like in this total crazy, you know, fictitious world, it's like filmed in, you know, just a realistic style, you know, and the visuals are just, yeah. you look at the, I wish I saw, I, I just watched it on HBO Max in, in, at home, but I wish I saw it in theaters because this film yeah, is yeah. meant for the theater experience. It was just like, whoa, right. yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, no, it's definitely on the list. And uh, another I, I, one got, I got, oh. I got ahead, wrapped sorry. into this Cobra Kai thing and it's just like, it's got its hooks in me right now. So <laughs> is, it, is it really that good? Because I, I noticed it's on Netflix popped up like, well, you know, it's Kai funny. Too? It's like, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, I don't, I'm not sure how old you are. I think we're probably roughly around the same age. I'm 45. So I'm a bit young, uh, like turning close to 37 april i'll be there okay so it's a few so years back for, but. for me I, you know i was nine years old when karate kid came out so it was just like huge yeah and when i first when i watched the first episode i was just like totally in hook line and sinker and probably because of the nostalgia and it scratches that constantly it's constantly hitting you with those nostalgia serotonin hits you know yeah but it does it in a way that's not gratuitous to me it's entertaining it's really self um self-aware of how silly it is which i also really like mm. and yeah i guess just from that perspective i sort of love it so uh, we've been watching it just one after the other and and i, th I suspect we'll be done by the end of the weekend <laughs> I'll, I'll have to check it out like uh, yeah, i was gonna like wary i'm like ralph uh, I, I can't pronounce his name but uh yeah ralph macchio yeah and i mean the other dude terrible, i'm like but... yeah yeah i was like come on but the acting is terrible, but they know it's terrible. And it's, so that's kind of the thing that I enjoy about it. It's not trying to be something that it isn't, you know? Yeah, that's why I kind of avoided like um, on Peacock, they, they did remade uh, Saved by the Bell. And it's like, ah, oh yeah, no, no, I no. avoid that, no. Yeah, no. totally. <laughs> I, I barely could stand it when it was uh, the original Saved by yeah, the yeah, Bell. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, um, oh, uh, I, I did have a good question. Any Regarding like film now, um, any favorite film scores you could uh, quote yes. off the top of your head or like one uh, of the one of my favorites of all time is Under the Skin. Hmm. I don't know if you've seen that. It's a Jonathan Glazer film. Uh, Scarlett Johansson's in it. I, it's a, an amazing, amazing film, and the score is just so good. And uh, Mika Levy is the one who did the score. She's amazing, and yeah, that's one of my favorites. Hmm. Um, the the score for uh punch drunk love is also brilliant Interesting. which is john bryan and i think paul, paul thomas anderson has a pretty good use of music in his films i think he's pretty smart about it and he gets the right people like there will be blood that's technically not a score because the film was finished and johnny green or the music was finished and paul thomas anderson just took johnny greenwood's music and put it in oh wow but it still functions like a score um, and it's brilliant. Yeah, I think Paul Thomas, An Paul Thomas Anderson is sort of like the modern Kubrick to me in that I think his visual sensibility relates to Kubrick pretty heavily mm. and his storytelling sensibility. And he uses music in a similar way to Stanley Kubrick, who's always been one of my favorite directors in terms of music. But all that stuff, like Kubrick stuff was all that wasn't score it was just like placed music you know yeah um and i and i love it for sure but it's definitely not a score in the traditional sense sorry my phone just got wonky here oh no worries but um 
Uh, yeah, I guess the, the one that really sticks out to me, though, is Under the Skin. I think that's probably my favorite score of the last 20 years. Oh, wow. And it's a really unassuming score. It's just, uh, it's hard to explain until you see it. It's just so perfectly appropriate. Hmm. I'll, have to, I'll have to check it out. I, I don't think I've uh, watched that film. I'm, oh, it's so good. I'm actually, you know, I, I've been studying more of film, <laughs> classical films, uh, during to the pandemic, I, I've kind of just dove into Criterion Channel online. Oh, yeah. Just, like, just yeah. watching all the classics like Tchaikovsky and... Uh, oh, my God, yeah. I love, actually, visually, I love Chungking uh, Express, you know, from... Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, what's what's his name? Uh, I love the cinematographies in Hong Kong still. Uh, Pete, no, uh, Doyle. Uh, yes. Um, is it Peter? Trying to tip my tongue. It might be Peter. Uh, that feels like it might Christopher, be right. Christopher. Christopher. Yeah. Yeah. He. He's. I. I just love that. Uh, rough kind of. His cinematography is great. I. I, I just love yeah. that. Uh, deep shadow and, and the light. Uh, you know, accentuation of uh, the saturated kind of uh, color as well. It just. Yeah. That's the mood. Just. It's. It's it has his own unique uh, style. You know. And. Absolutely. Uh, what was I going? I don't know. I just so yeah. I've been collecting just a list of uh, films and just nerding out or trying to take myself to film school on my own. <laughs> yeah, course. yeah. I'm trying to just pick apart the visual components of yep. you know the classical great you know directors and cinematographers and, and try to yeah. incorporate that into my work. Which you know myself, I, I've kind of taken a hit because you know I haven't been able to go to venues really or. Um, capture people uh one-on-one -on -one directly not too much I, i've had a few shoots this year but uh yeah that's no, been hard the venue really thing hard. has kind of been ups and downs you know everybody yeah. tries to book a tour and then kind of has to cancel right. it's like so my conversation yeah. series has kind of kept me at bay but yeah yeah for sure yeah i was fortunate to have a really good the last two years have been very good to me but I think when everything shut down, I had a couple of months of quiet and then everybody was like, hey, let's make a record. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's get tested, make sure we're cool, make a record. And then everybody had that idea all at once. So it worked out pretty well. But I and used to miss, you know, I miss going to places like Upstate Films. I used to go there all the time mm -hmm. and don't, I mean, you can go. I'm just not that comfortable doing it. But um, Criterion, thank God for Criterion Collection. Yeah. All those old Kurosawa, um, Kurosawa movies are great for that. Yeah, like all that black and white use of light and shadow is really brilliant for the visual language, and I don't always love like old martial arts films, but they're all they're, they're often visually pretty impressive. Oh yeah, yeah, they're for epics sure. though, so you gotta yeah. dedicate yeah, at yeah. least three hours. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, it's like uh, all right, I, I no gotta doubt about it. sit down and just watch, and that's yeah. it. That's all I'm doing for these. Yeah three four hours you know? yeah totally and um, you know we watched um we've seen it before but we watched the revenant recently again yeah yeah and that cinematographer i can never remember his name but that film is just so good visually it's just so incredible there's like maybe two or three objectionable cgi moments that they couldn't have done any other way yeah uh, and i only say objectionable because i just generally have a, an allergy towards cgi but um the the actual real film work in that is just camera work and that is brilliant and that was with leo right uh yeah i don't think that's yeah leo the only and one tom I hardy missed. that's always been on my list i i've always missed oh you somehow. should you should definitely watch it if you have like a, a snow day where you're doing nothing and you can dedicate you know a three-hour movie it's really it's worth the watch hmm. it's brilliant it's it's really well acted it's very suspenseful and visually it's stunning have you had the opportunities to work professionally on on film scores or uh, engineer or sound yeah, for films? Yeah, definitely done a, a lot of film score work, both engineering and, and compositionally. Hmm. And um, I did actually years ago, I did a whole bunch of score work for MTV, like Real World and Road Rules and shows like that. Yeah. Um, they would have like every time a season came out on DVD or something, they couldn't use all the hits that they had used in the first versions of the show so they would rescore every episode so you know like at the beginning of the year i would get five seasons of one of these shows to do over the next six months 
Hmm. And yeah, but you know, it was great. I mean, that was a pure money gig because there was no real creative impulse there. But the interesting thing was sort of like reverse engineering, you know, like for instance, if they had a song in, a, in an episode that they wanted kind of a similar thing for, it was interesting to re- sort of reverse engineer and unpack what the song was and what components made it what it was. So it was a very big learning experience for me. And I was young, I was in my mid twenties. Hmm. Um, and it allowed, it paid very well. So I could like, that, that was when I sort of had the money to be able to have my own studio. Hmm. Um, but yeah, th- so I did, I've done a lot of scoring work for sure. Cool. And, and mixing of scoring work. I had a kind of hypothetical question, I guess. Um, what do you think is more powerful? A singular image, a sound, you know, like a beautiful uh, song or musical piece, or um, a really engaging story or a powerful story? What, what do you think uh, is more powerful wow. these days in the, the world of oversaturation and uh, just overload of content, I guess, you know? <laughs> I, it, it, thinking about it through the framework of right now, mm. I would say probably a still image is the most powerful. Mm. But that being said, to me, like when I, especially if you're thinking about politically or socially or culturally, I think the story is more, can has the potential to be more powerful because it probably says a lot more than a single picture would. But I still, yeah, I'm just a visual person. I would still gravitate toward the, the still picture. Yeah. Well, I think we're we're in such a visual world these days, compared yes. you know with uh, with the Instagram, well, just with social media and and just Absolutely. the web just kind of evolving to what it is today. We're all inundated with visuals, so it's like, yeah. like so how and do the we... power you you can create a narrative from a still based on whatever your biases are. You know, it's very easy to sort of take a photograph of two people engaged in something. Hmm. and frame it in one way or another based on your political biases and put it out into the world and just let it do its thing. And it has a power that transcends the reality of what's happening in that. You could literally take a picture of two people having a conversation, but if you frame it the right way, it can have a life of its own in the social media world that's far beyond what the actual reality is. So it's kind of insane, you know? That is true. No, you're right. And, and when we grew up, like, you know, there were, I guess there were interpretations of things. But if you saw an image, say, like um, one that sticks to mind, because I just always remember it was the Kent State, uh, when the National Guard shot the students at Kent State. And there's the one image of the woman with the long brown hair sitting over the man who got shot on the tennis court or whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. And you can't really walk away. That image is pretty sort of unequivocal. It says what it says. Like a kid got shot, his friend is mourning him. And that's the power of that image. And it's also the power, you know, the, it says like a little bit about government overreach and the and Vietnam War and all that stuff. But the image itself is pretty well set what it is and what it means to people. But if you had that same image or a similar image now, its meanings could be all over the place depending on what your political leanings are and your political leanings are influenced by other images that you've seen and and digested. So it's this crazy thing where this cycle is just like feeding itself with dogma and misinformation and all this crazy shit that we've never really had before. It's kind of unprecedented. Yeah. You know, going back to, you know, to actual photojournalism at the time, you know, you could take a photograph, as is that scene. But now you, you take, say, that same Kent State image and you can distort it any way you want with, oh, yeah. you know, the way you can uh, frame it in, in the uh, internet and uh, with this, just our funneled society with uh, our specific groups on Facebook, et cetera. Right, you know? right. Um, and you can also easily distort that image to make it look like it was like, whatever party, whatever side, whatever yep. d- is doing, did that killing, you know? It, yeah, yeah. You know, you can make it like, you can distort that into saying that was the Chinese government, you know? <laughs> like, right, right. You, you can make up anything these days, yeah. easily digitally distort it and uh, yeah. use it for your own, whatever agenda that is, you know? And yep. Um, yep. actually, I, I'm still fascinated. I, I've kind of studied up on like, you know, metadata or, or just the, the processes of 
reverse tracing an image and yep. uh, the seeing the actual source of an image to see if it's fake. It's a fascinating yep. process. Maybe that's my CJ degree coming back. Oh, yeah, yeah. But uh, actually, it's, it's valuable information for everybody to know how to... Oh, sure. To ask, is this actually what's happening um, in this image or this little right. clickbait, or is it just clickbait? Generally, right. it's mo mostly clickbait, you know? And yeah. It's, uh, it's uh, either a team of uh, hackers or just what it, from certain entity distorting the, the reality of uh, whatever actually occurred in that scene. Right. Um, which is actually, it's funny you say, I have a meta, friend, right? Yeah, totally. I have a friend who, well, not a friend, but somebody I know who had an image used, an image they took was used in a publication. And she wrote the publication and said, hey, I, this is my photograph. And they were like, no, it's not. Hmm. And she said, yeah, well, it is. Let's go into the metadata. And of course, lo and behold, it was her photograph and she had to get paid for it. But they, it, it's, it's funny, you said, it just made me think of that, you know, that looking up metadata thing, it's pretty intense. Well, that's why I'm always wary of like posting good stuff on Instagram and stuff. Oh, like I've had that happen where it's just like, they'll just do a screenshot of my own, own yeah. work and then use it to, for their own promotional uh, reasoning. Right. Like, even just musical artists in, in some musical publications in the city and I'm like no no yeah yeah you didn't even ask me how like how right. do you think this is proper like right i'm, I'm always wary of like producing uh, like posting original work online because it's like yeah. i know what's going to happen or i have to be wary not to you know post uh yeah i have to do it like a, a bit to dis distort the image a bit you know obviously not put like a 300 dpi image you know <laughs> Right. I, I, it took some le hard lessons learned on that one. Oh, yeah, for <laughs> no sure. No high res, just kind of distort it, blur it, uh, kind of digitally sign it everywhere. But then right. I'm like, it looks like crap when I buy a signature everywhere. I'm like, ah, right. I'll just create some abstract stuff that nobody can. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At least I'm posting. But yeah, it, it's it, it, we're in just the super weird like matrix world man <laughs> like yeah where people are debating if the world is actually flat you know right. like right now we it's have, pretty wild oh oh man it's insane uh well any uh i guess um man um now i'm just thinking of this weird world we're in sorry man <laughs> no it's all good no, you get I think about it every day. Yeah, no, it's like it's super heady, but then I'm like, oh crap. I, I'll get two out there. I'm like, all right, rein it in because it, it will take me to a place where I don't want to go. Oh, yeah. So I, have to just I mean, my of... world is pretty much like in my studio most of the day. And then when I come out of my studio, I read New York Times or whatever my news feed is. And I'm like, oh, Jesus, this world is fucking crazy. Yeah. And then I always forget for the 10 hours or, or so that I'm in this room, I totally forget about the outside world. That's true. Like yeah. I can imagine like as an engineer, I actually, I used to work uh, back in Boston. I was in a command center um, for the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And yeah. I was just surrounded by monitors. And, and I was overnight, 12 to 8, locked in this like monitor, like surrounded by monitors, nobody to interact with. <laughs> I was like, right. fried. Man. Like, wow. Oh. It was, uh, that was a surreal, well, then that's when I started to think, like, how, how we actually interact with machines, you know, and I, I, I kind of yeah. get into UX design after that, because, oh, wow. because of that experience, because I'm like, yeah. how do we interact with, it's, it's had me start wondering how we, uh, as humans actually interact with machines and interfaces right. all the time, and how it affects our, our, our psyche, you know, it, yeah. I dove deep into that for a while. and uh, it, it, It'll be interesting. I mean, we'll both be dead by the time they do a post-mortem on this generation and this era. Yeah. To yeah. see, like, the effects that our screen time and our those sort of stimuli have on us. It's got to be intense. Oh, I know. Oh, yeah. Actually, yeah, it would be curious. Like, it would be cool if we could, like, jump into the future to see, like, that, that those recordings, you know, or that, yeah. those, those documentations and the studies. And, like... They're like, oh yeah, what a dumb species. Or we, that, yeah. you know, like they 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 really mess themselves up, you know. 
and so, and ironically so brilliant too like the things we design and come up with as humans can be so amazing and the shit we choose to use them for is like mind-blowing to me That's it's true. incredible like when you think about the things just in general like I mean, I'm a huge car guy, so I'm a petrol head. I love classic cars. I love, I just love cars. Yeah. yeah. And when I think about the, the sort of the trajectory of like supercars, for instance, you know, like big Ferraris and Porsches and, and McLarens and like mega, mega supercars and the way the technology, how brilliant it is that people have figured out a way to make electricity into a power, into a power source for a vehicle that can go hundred miles an hour in three seconds, mm. like all of the brilliant things that need to happen to make that reality is mind blowing. Yeah. And then to think that we can harness that, all of that intellectual energy into the dumbest, most asinine shit ever conceivable is just, it's like, it never fails to blow my mind. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> I mean, when you think about it, like in the course of a hundred years, we, went from having no cars to having these insanely powerful like half electric or full electric cars with massive screens that we can talk to other people through at a moment's notice and like we can open up all these avenues of creative and and, and interesting expression and in that that all happened in the course of like 100 years yeah that's kind of insane yeah and then at the same time we've also done the most ridiculous things possible and there are, like you said, there are people who still debate whether the world's flat. There are still people who debate whether the election was won last year. I mean, just the most insane stuff. It's crazy yeah. to me that we that this species can do both of those things. No, I in, agree. In, in equal intensity, too. <laughs> and hand in hand, we we've kind of evolved and devolved at the same time. Totally. Like, like yeah, our yeah. communications, I feel like has really devolved. Yeah uh where people absolutely. don't even want to have a phone conversation they'll text or ghost you and like absolutely i mean why don't you just express how you're feeling over a phone call instead yeah. of text and it's wild yeah oh man yeah i it's so the, it, it's the grand irony like we have at our fingertips this amazing communication device on us at all times and the ways we choose to use that communication device in negative ways it's just it's remarkable to me I feel like all dystopian novels and literature and films have been correct. You know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> they, you know, it's like, you know, I love, uh, you know, 1984, you know, Orwell's yeah. 84. And, you know, they, it's exactly that. We, we've been using, uh, you know, communication or, 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 or technology and science just to kind of maybe distort population and try to control a certain aspect of popu uh, the the pop human population and it's like yeah i've seen this coming for years because you know it, yeah and nobody's like everybody and the people like shocked is this happening i'm not shocked i, I could have told you this was happening 10 20 years ago you know absolutely um, i mean i'm in the room with musicians all day long so i see a lot of different personal like human archetypes yeah and i i would you know this is I'm not saying this because of a lack of humility, but I'm saying this because I think it's real that I, I've seen probably every type of human working on records for the last 25 years. And I'm totally with you. I could see this coming many, many years ago. Like the way people communicate, when you give them avenues to communicate negatively, they will do it. And it's just maybe the maybe a reality of human nature that we're unwilling to confront, but <laughs> it is absolutely in our DNA. Yeah, it, it's, I guess, the human condition, you know? <laughs> That's it. That's it. Um, actually, I noticed you, you, you shot, uh, this is uh, the kit. And I, I've had her on, um, not maybe the beginning of the year or the end of 2020, I've, I've talked to her. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, or mid-2020. I forget this is 2022 already. Wow. Or right, 2021. Right. Yeah. Time for the last couple of years, by the way, has just been warped. And I, yeah. I feel like it's still kind of 2019. I don't know why, you know, yeah. Yeah. what happened these last couple of years. I don't know. But uh, have you worked? Uh, have you continued a relationship with her or was that a one time yeah. thing? Or cool. Yeah, yeah, we did. Um, I went over in March, uh, well, late February into March of 2020. 
yeah, which was right when the pandemic was starting to really take a foothold in in the UK, and went to Peter Gabriel's studio in the UK. And we made that record, um, and then yeah, shot some pictures while we were there. Because one thing I like to do is always do portraits when I'm working on sessions. Cool. And just find an interesting spot, do everybody in the same spot with the same light, and. Um, yeah, and then I, I did a cover of one of the songs that we made on that record called um, This Is What You Did. I made a, my own cover of that. And I, I went through a period last year where I thought like, hmm, I'm going to cover a couple of songs that I've worked on. Hmm. And um, I, I started it and I never really completed it. But I did do that cover. And yeah, Kate and I still talk from time to time. She's brilliant. And yeah. I hope to do another record with her because I think she's amazing. Oh, yeah. No, we... Uh... We had a great conversation, and uh, actually, we we're, we're schedule we have to schedule a follow up because she wanted we we're everything was yeah I think we had to like reconnect four times on on Zoom you know oh, wow. but but we were like flowing and then it was like <laughs> choppy and then I'm like okay we, we're gonna do this again uh, sometime so I've yeah. been trying to uh, reconnect shortly but ah. Uh, oh yeah it's yeah she's she's amazing awesome energy. and we made that yeah. record it was a crazy thing because hmm. um josh kaufman who i work with often on records him and i got to the uk i want to say on a sunday and then the next morning we opened up the paper and it was like fifty thousand new cases in london wow. one hundred thousand new cases and it was just like holy shit what's happening yeah and right after we finished that record um i was flying my wife over to paris and I figured like, we're over there. Why don't you come to Paris? I'll fly to Paris. We'll meet. We'll have a beautiful like week long trip, 10 day trip for your birthday. And we did, but we, so we were in Paris while the pandemic was really starting to rage here. Mm. And, um, you know, it was like four o'clock in the morning when morning and Monique woke me up in Paris and she was like, I think we have to go home because shit's getting crazy and we're not going to be able to get back in the country. And lo and behold, like we learned that we could get back in the country, but it was pretty wild yeah. to be there. Nobody was masking. Um, and of course, because nobody understood it then. And the only thing that was really different in Paris was that the, the Louvre and museums were like having less people in, in the building at one time and taking no cash. It was only um, credit card. But other than that, it was pretty business as usual. Hmm. And Parisians are always pretty nonplussed about that stuff anyway. They just do whatever they want. But yeah, it was like every day just seeing thousands and th tens of thousands of new cases. Wow. And then getting back to the, we got back to the States in like March 18th or something, like the day that New York shut down, basically. We got back wow. to New York and it was pretty wild. So making that record with that atmosphere was really intense because every day we, we talked about it a lot every day. Yeah. And it was sort of, um, you know, it was definitely a point of paranoia for everybody in the room. It was like, man, I'm feeling a little strange. Do I have COVID? Is this what this, you know, or whatever it was. Yeah. Pretty wild to make a record in those circumstances, especially there, you know. Well, there's a story for you, man. Like, uh, yeah. it's a little short film too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> have you had a, a chance to, to work on any film stuff, like personal projects? or? Yeah, yeah. I've made a couple short films um, and done a lot of music videos. Cool. And they tend to be people, artists that I've made records with. And sometimes I'll get struck with an idea and I'll just say, hey, I have this idea for a video. Do you have any interest? And we often do it. And then I filmed um, Craig Finn from The Hold Steady did a record release performance at Murmur Theater in Brooklyn in 2019 um, that I filmed and directed because I had worked on the record. So I filmed and directed that. And I also filmed and directed... Um, the band Muzz did a, a film last year because they couldn't tour. So they did a couple live stream performances. Uh, well, they weren't, they were pre-recorded and we, we actually made a proper concert film, uh, two of them. So yeah, I've done a bunch of film work on my own. Cool. I still have probably 10 scripts that I'd love to shoot at some point in my life. It's just time is very inconveniently not accessible all the time, you know? Yeah. Uh, but I, I love film as a medium. I would love to do it more. It just, it's the sort of thing it's like I am so immersed in what I do hmm. uh, as an engineer that it's hard to conceive of myself immersing the way I would need to to make a film and, and like I would have to abandon my career you know That's which true. is a hard thing to do yeah no it's like yeah if you really want to be good at 
you know, yeah. film, you get to immerse yourself in that process too, which Absolutely, is yeah. a totally different process comparatively yep. to what you do as well. And it's, it's that way with photography. Like when somebody yeah. calls me to do a photography thing, sometimes it's like a classic car collector wants to do a shoot or a magazine thing. It's just, I have to think about like, wow, is this going to take any time away from, it has to totally work with my studio work. And if it doesn't, I can't do it, you know? Yeah. 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 Wow. Well, I guess, uh, well, actually, I guess uh, I'll, I'll wrap uh, with like, what do you see kind of, uh, I guess, or your hopes for like your studio, your, your future kind of vision for your studio and your work, or do you see kind of evolving to something like maybe more, you know, uh, film or uh, photographic stuff or like- I think probably I can see myself being pretty much doing what I'm doing until I'm cool. a, a pile of ashes. Yeah. But uh, one thing I've been looking at, I've, I'd love to buy an old church. I've always loved old churches and I've always wanted to buy an old church. I should have bought one in Kingston 10 years ago when they were dirt cheap. Yeah. Um, uh, that's, that's the one thing I would love. It's either that or like finding a farm somewhere kind of like tucked into the Catskills um, and like building a studio just out in the middle of nowhere, you know, yeah. Yeah. And being being completely disengaged from the sort of normal thing. I also love Montana. Both my partner and I love Montana and Wyoming. It's kind of like heartland for us. So I sort of love, I love the idea of having a big studio out in Montana. I just know that I don't think I could survive the winters out there. Yeah. <laughs> They're a little too intense. Do you have uh, people out there in Montana or did you just fall in love with the? the well, state? I just oh. fell in love with it, but I, we do, we befriended this guy named Jim Roscoe, who's a state congressman or state mm. represent. Uh, he's in the state assembly and um, he has a ranch out there that we stay at pretty much every year when we go, we stay there for half the time and then we go to Montana and stay uh, at another place. So that's pretty much the extent of the people we know. I mean, we made friends out there peripherally through doing different, different things. Like I did, um, uh, a record with Bob Weir from the Grateful Dead a few years ago and he when they went on tour they asked me to make films for them to play while they were playing performing which was great because then I could go out and make these really sweeping landscape films and um, so my partner and I went out in 2016 or 17 and made those and um, or maybe it was 18 I, either way um, and in the process, we befriended like cowboys and stuff who we were filming for these these performance films. And it was really amazing. Mm. And so, yeah, we know some people out there, but nobody we'd call like close, close friends, you know. OK, yeah, yeah. That's cool. Man. I haven't I haven't explored out there. Uh, really, no, it's incredible. I've been, you know, California, of course, but uh, been more on the coast side. Family, yeah. Yeah. family on the East Coast and family on the West Coast. But yeah, it, not so much. But I, I have to. Oh. Yeah, once you hit the Rockies, it's a, it's a very interesting world. It's very, um, you know, politically, I think people have the impression that there's a lot of hillbillies out there, but politically, it's pretty libertarian. It's pretty much just like, leave me alone. Let me do my thing. Yeah. You know, I don't want neighbors um, and people will help each other out when it's necessary. It's that kind of vibe. And um, the landscape is gorgeous. To me, it's like the most beautiful part of the world. And I've been a lot of places in the world, but none of it hits me like it does out there wow i have to explore that more. like um, yeah at least do some more research on and the, the, the visual or landscape of montana yeah yeah it's through your, your a few shots uh it's like wow i didn't even know like desert you know like oh, that's yeah. crazy yeah, yeah yeah uh so i didn't wild. i didn't even know you know so um i guess so a final question with the, the pandemic as is now and the virus kind of always constantly mutating, um, how do you think like uh, the future of like live performances will, do you think it'll always like evolve into like a half kind of breed kind of thing where you may have to just, uh, you know, do outdoor performances or what do you think uh, the future of live performances? I that's, guess? A, that's a good, I mean, the optimist in me wants to believe that I think probably re realistically the virus isn't going anywhere. Yeah. So I think the best hope we have is that it evolves into some sort of stasis where it's just, it's among us, but it's fairly non-lethal and that it's kind of, hopefully gets to a place where it's basically like the flu and people 
who can't handle that are smart about going out. And as a result, like, you know, I don't want to say life goes back to normal per se, but um, I'd like to think that we get to a place where we accept the risks inherent in, in, in it and get back to just normal performances, you know? Yeah. Cause it's definitely like, live performance for sure but also just in general you know seeing other people masked all the time i think creates a it, it's on a temporary basis it's fine but i think long term you lose intimacy we're an intimate culture and like you know being a touring musician i've i've been in a lot of cultures particularly cultures that are are used to wearing masks or used to wearing um uh, some sort of protective clothing and there's a there's a sort of a disconnected human interaction in cultures like that mm. that I think we're I just don't think we're equipped to handle you know I I don't know that we're equipped to handle that and I don't know that that's a bad thing because I like the intimacy that you have when you're in a group of of other people watching a band play and you're all connecting to it on a similar level and you can see each other's face and spatial expressions that stuff is so powerful. Yeah. And I think it's very easy to take for granted when we don't have it. Uh, it's easy to take for granted or when we have it, it's easy to take it for granted. Hmm. And I think we're starting to see that now. And a lot of the fatigue that people have of like, Oh, I just want to go out and I want to see people's faces and I want to see people smile. And like, I remember earlier this year when you could finally go to a concert or go see a movie or go to a bar, everybody was so excited because you could have that connection again. I mean, that's part of what drives us in everyday life, you know? And so I, yeah, I guess the optimist in me wants to see that happen. <laughs> yeah. I hope. Well, same. Like I long for live performance again, like, uh, or going to uh, yeah, uh, a venue that's full, but I, I've been hesitant yeah. since, of course, you know, been careful and, but yeah, I, I've had, uh, I've been fortunate to catch some live outdoor shows this year, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, which has been cool because I needed music, you know, I just, Yep, like yep. performance and uh i haven't really done the venue stuff w which started me on uh, my my photographic journey where it was like right. say going to um Bowery ballroom and um oh my god i can't remember the name now it's right there it's on the lower east side too uh, oh my god uh oh uh, uh irving uh, webster hall not webster uh webster uh, is not lower east side uh oh my god uh, mercury uh, mercury lounge Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mercury Lounge, uh, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Venues like that. I, I miss yeah. going to, but oh no. You know, it's uh, things have changed. So I, I don't know if I'll ever do that type of shooting again. But actually, I do need to go through what I've been uh, kind of kind of stuck. Uh, kind of maybe just hasn't. I, I haven't gone through all my archives from 2017 to present, which Maybe I've just been like building it up. Like that seems just too momentous or just like, uh, I don't want to go through 2017 to now because right. probably, probably like a thousand images. You know? Right. Like, right. Uh, but I have to, because uh, I have a show here this year at the Holland center in beacon. Um, yep. and generally every year prior to pandemic, I was putting on from 2018. Um, I was printing out my images and had the bands I've shot perform like the first, uh uncontaminated i had was at uh, barry electric in the lower east yeah. side which is super cool because i had like yeah. diverse bands and then just the the group of people that showed up were just like they met each other and people made friends from that i love that just the connection yeah, yeah. and then yeah. being surrounded by imagery and it was cool because my work was in the same room they they had uh bob gruen's work hanging in the same uh, like in that, yeah. i'm like yeah cool yeah yeah but, uh Oh man, I, I just love the the history of uh, culture and the the city and Absolutely. and, and um, I hope to get back to it. But if not, I, I I think my end goal for this year, if I I don't put together at least a prototype of a book, because I, I think I have enough material, and with the conversations too, I, I hope to maybe get the rights to or permissions to to print out the transcripts and maybe oh yeah publish a book, but. Uh, that's a brilliant idea yeah 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 that i think that's my major goal this year but that yeah. i had i just have to kind of figure it out <laughs> but right right yeah yeah it's um, pretty wild i mean if there's any silver lining people have found creative ways to do new things 
during the pandemic. So that I guess true. if there's any silver lining, that's it, you know, well, like actually, the way people, yeah. have, oh, the way people have done some outdoor shows and, mm. and creatively expressing themselves with various things, I think has been interesting. So hopefully that stuff lasts too. Well, I agree. Uh, kind of just over kind of thinking or thinking through the, the span of my conversations, it's, yeah, it has been like this collective do you do it yourself kind of um, culture in, in 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 the art and the creative worlds where yeah like we're gonna perform we're gonna perform on rooftops you know and like yeah yeah even classical like I, I've made friends with classically trained musicians who are like you know chairs in the, the Met Orchestra and they found themselves have having to busk you know their gear on the subway and just kind of yep. go back to the roots of let's play, yeah. you know, and yeah. cross collaboration, which I love. Yep. And um, yep. that's also what I hope that continues to this organic organicness and the need to create and yeah. having these cross disciplines collaborate. That's right. Yeah. And um, I think I, I've always like, initially I've always asked this question, like the driving force in this momentous occasion of like the next artistic movement. I, but I think we are in one now, which we were longing for prior to the yeah. pandemic. I think- Oh, I agree. I think it was very individualistic prior to this pandemic, but now everybody's kind of cross collaborating and getting together. Yeah. So I, I think this could be that movement yeah, uh, but yeah. Once again, I guess we'd have to extract ourselves and go into the future as historians right. and say that was the COVID period. Right. I guess. Right. Yeah. Uh, who knows what it'll, what, it'll, what the postmortem will look like? It'll be interesting to see. No, exactly. Um, but uh, I'll let you go, sir. Um, cool. On that note, and uh, it was a pleasure speaking with you. Absolutely. Thank you, man. Yeah. I, hopefully, I, I can uh, swing by up there one day and uh, yeah. say hello. Anytime you're around. All right, man. Take care. Peace. Peace. See you, man.